now uh, we're gonna see the three case study, case of the financial crisis. It's related to currency crisis. Uh, starting with the Mexican peso crisis in 1994. So on December 20th, 1994, the Mexican government announced a plan to devalue peso against the dollar 14%. And that decision is actually um, changed the market expectation about future value of peso. So the government decide something and then market perceive that this is actually um, not the one that they expect. And then they change the trade expectation about the future value. So, Peso held by about 40%. So it's a really just a big depreciation, big depreciation. So this is the graph we can see. This is Mexican Peso, basically all kinds of fixed rate, right? And then they actually drop a little bit, but it declined very much up to like about 40%. And it actually uh, affect, especially, so if the currency depreciate a lot, the good thing is, not really good thing, but the, the benefit is probably they can export more. But the problem of the Mexico is they also have to import a lot of things from the United States and the price level start to increase, increase. So this Mexican peso crisis is quite unique. I mean, some people say that this crisis is kind of the, um, the, the, it's come from the NAFTA actually, because NAFTA uh, is a, around the NAFTA time actually, and the, like the free trade and the globalization because now they can freely, like people can freely trade their currency in Mexico but basically this is very unique because it will be the first serious international financial crisis. And basically two lessons emerge. Now it's essential to have multinational safety. So basically this is cross-border flight, right? So this comes from the, so the, the, the crisis comes from I mean, even though the, the decision made by the Mexican government, the crisis actually occurred because of international portfolio um, and the, they basically uh, give us lesson that, uh, well, we need to have some multinational safety net of, uh, to safeguard the world financial system. And an influx of foreign capital can lead overvaluation in the first place. So this is basically, this is right, you know, uh, the, the, the crisis starts from the liberalization, you know. If you loosen, uh, open the market then, and then the foreign capital start to, in, uh, start to coming in, then it's actually, make overvalue the currencies. You know. And then the next crisis we're gonna see is the Asian currency crisis. It's kind of a big crisis in East Asia. Uh, it affects many, many countries actually. So Asian crisis turned out to be far more serious than Mexican peso crisis. Mexican peso crisis is pretty regional because it only affects them usually there's Mexico and probably not in North America. But it, the Asian crisis actually affects lots of Asian countries. 
and we, we see actually contagion effect. So it actually starts from the Thailand and then contaginated to the other countries. And it's quite serious, severe uh, crisis and a lot of economic and social cost incur. Many firms with foreign currency bond were forced in bankruptcy because now if the firm has the foreign currency denominated debt, then they need a lot more their own currency to buy, I mean, to pay back if the currency depreciates too much. Because the local currency gets cheaper, then you need the, the, the company needs more money to pay back the foreign debt. So the region, the Asia actually experienced deep widespread recession. So this is the case like the, well, um, there's a Korean one, Thai baht, Indonesian rupiah graph. And you see the, how serious we are. Like the, they are pretty stable. And it start from Thai. So in, you, you look at Thai and Thai bars around July actually starting. And then it immediately actually affect the Indonesia. And Indonesian economy is probably, it's big economy, but it's still, uh, the fundamentals are weaker than like Thailand or Korea. And Korean actually one started to decline around October and November and then depreciated. And not just like these currencies, these are probably the, th the uh, symbolic currencies that we can find, but many other Asian currencies actually experience exactly the same thing. So the origin of the Asian currency crisis is actually very similar to the Mexican crisis. So it happened after opening the market. So as capital market opened, large inflow of private capital resulted in credit boom in Asian countries. So there are a lot of credits actually, foreign credits around in Asia because the market just opened, right? And then, Usually that time the Asian country has the kind of stable, like a managed it, fixed exchange rate system. So people think that this is safe, right? So they don't hatch the financial transactions because of the st stable exchange rate system. And then also they, can, they may take excessive risk by both borrower and lender, not just borrower, but also lenders also think that, well, this is kind of stable place because of the stable exchange rate. But if real exchange rate starts to rise, then export growth starts to slow, which means that now they must they start to have some trouble. So large inflex, in, inflex uh, inflows of the capital basically overvalue the currencies first of all. And because of that, you know, your export growth slow down because your currency appreciate too much. And then it, it, because it's overvalues, it becomes kind of the attacking uh, currencies like the So the hedge fund think that, well, this is time to sell. So if after they start to sell, then the currency value start to decline. Also, Japan's recession starting uh, from 1991-92 actually hurt too. So if Asian currencies had been allowed to depreciate in the real term, so I mean, they should depreciate earlier than the crisis period because you know, it happens before the time. So what happened is the first large inflow of foreign capital, right? And this inflow lead overvaluation, which means that appreciate, right? Should appreciate actually. And then export slow down. So real rates start to depreciate, right? Now, because 
I mean, to avoid this depreciation, they don't allow it, right? So they have to have to use their dollars to protect against this attack, this, so that they can actually keep the fixed exchange rate. So they keep using their dollars and once their dollars gone, so they use most dollars, then sudden and catastrophic changes happen in 1997. So if the system is flexible, floating, then the market actually, market can adjust it before really big event like the incident happens, sudden incident happen, right? But because they choose the fixed exchange rate system, they don't have, they didn't have time to adjust it. So in 1997, everything had bomb. Eventually something had to give up. So Thai bot start to decline. Sudden collapse of Thai bot touch up the panicky flight capital from other Asian countries. So all Asian countries have started to have trouble. So th there's lessons here. This is important lessons. We have three point here, right? The country cannot have all three, only have two of them. Fixed exchange rate system, free international flow of capital, and independent monetary policy. They only have two of them, not the, all three. This is called incom incompatible trinity. So generally speaking, liberalization of the financial market when combined with a weak, undeveloped domestic finance system tends to create an environment susceptible to currency and the financial crisis. You know, interestingly, both Mexico and the Korea, South Korea experienced a major currency crisis within a few years after joining OECD, you know, and OECD is basically the, you know, OECD countries are developed country, but they're not really well developed. Their financial system is actually underdeveloped. And after they joined the OECD, so they actually have to, have to do the significant liberalization of financial market. After a few years, the problem occurs. It seems to safe to recommend that the country first strengthen their domestic financial system and then liberalize it. And even though a country decides to liberalize its financial market, it should encourage foreign direct investment, not the portfolio investment and long-term bond investment. So the, the investment should be long-term. The foreign direct one cannot be you know, taken out easily. Long-term bond investment is safer, but if it is short-term, it's dangerous. You know, the in South Korean case, the problem was a lot of South Korean banks actually financed through the short-term dollars, and then they, they basically lend the long-term dollars to the domestic. So it means that usually the long-term interest rate is higher than short-term, so they basically finance through the cheaper rate with the short-term, and then, they lend money, so they receive long-term higher interest, but the problem is they mismatch the liability and the asset. It is okay if the system is stable because they can keep refinancing it, but if something happened, then lots of financial institutions start to have trouble. So that's a major reason, that's a major reason. If a country would like to maintain monetary policy independence to pursue its own domestic economic goal and still would like to keep the fixed exchange rate system, then they should restrict this free flow of capital. So that's why they cannot get the two of them together. You know, China and India they are not noticeably affected by the Asian crisis because both countries maintain capital controls. No. Hong Kong was also less affected 
because Hong Kong has firmly fixed exchange rate system to US dollars, so it's called a PAC system, and a lot of free capital, a free flow of capital, but they don't have the third one, independent monetary policies. So they use Hong Kong dollar, but mostly they actually dollarize their economy. So a country cannot have all three, they only have 12 of them. Now exhibit 2.12 show the renminbi, which is the, the Chinese yuan versus US dollar exchange rate. So up to this point, they have a kind of fixed exchange rate system. And then they're allowed to have the, some floating, it's basically floating, but not, not exactly in a free float. So China maintained the fixed rate exchange rate system for a long time. And between 2005 and 2008, it floated. And then here, this is the Christ period. So they just fixed and then started to float again in 2010. And, you know, so Ramimbi becomes stronger and stronger, basically because there is a uh, mounting pressure, especially from the United States, because the United States believed that the China actually manipulate the, the exchange rate. So China uh, also have some pressure to, to um, have the stronger renminbi, stronger uh, the local currency like the Chinese win. They still control, but not as much as they had before. So some people think that the Chinese yuan may become the global currency because China is now number two country in terms of the GDP in the world. But if China wanna be, make their currency as a full fledged global currency, then China will need to satisfy these conditions. First of all, it has to have full convert convertibility of these currencies, open capital market, and the rule of law of protection of property right. So as you know, these systems are not satisfied yet. So United States dollars, US dollars and Euro basically satisfy these conditions. China, Chinese, we are not yet. But after satisfying this condition, they may, be, they may become more major currency, global currency in the world. Still, we don't use Chinese yuan a lot in global transaction, but if it satisfies, then it may uh, reposition to the at least the eurozone euro uh, status, I, I believe, or at least Japanese yen, probably better than that, because obviously China become the you know I mean China is major player in in world economy, obviously, right? Now the third crisis is the Argentinian yen peso crisis. So Argentinian peso crisis happened in 1991. Argentinian government passed the convertibility law that linked to the peso to the US dollar at parities. The initial economic effect is very positive. Argentinian chronic inflation was curtailed. So Argentina is very notorious for hyperinflations and it becomes stable. And then foreign investment poured in. But as you know, the foreign investment poured in, there's some, the problem happened too. As US dollar appreciate on the world market, Argentina and Paso become stronger as well because they actually linked with the dollar. No. So strong Paso hurt export from Argentina, obviously right? That's actually bad for economy, lead to downturn, and then the peso dollar parity actually is broke, uh, is down in January 2002. So basically they reform the system in 1991. So crisis really doesn't happen in 91, I'm sorry. Crisis happened 
in 2002, right? But it also comes from the strong link between the US dollar and the local currency, which is Argentinian peso. Because the export decrease, it actually lead, led to the downturn of the economy. The unemployment rate rose about 20% and inflation reaches about monthly rate 20% again. So if they're, they, they don't have fundament, like good fundamentals, no. If the economic fundamentals are not good, the currency system, exchange rate system does, uh, is solely cannot resolve all the issues. So this is the crisis. It's basically up, appreciation crisis, right? Or like this. So there are at least three factors that is related to, that relate to the, actually the collapse of the currency board arrangement and lead to the economic crisis. Now, these three conditions, lack of fiscal discipline. So they basically have to have a solid fiscal plan. Labor market inflexibility, labor market also should be at least somewhat flexible and contagion from the financial crisis in Brazil and Russia. Because at that time, Brazil and Russia started a problem I mean, it's actually contagionate, um, con contagionate, contagion from the Asian crisis. So Brazil, Russia started a problem, and this problem actually also goes to Argentina too. So in theory, the currency value is the fundamental strength of the underlying economy in the long run, not the short term, in the long run, if it is strong, then it's a strong currency, but it's, it's a weak and weak currency. But in the short run, so short term, currency trade expectation is important. Because this is the, also not the assets, right? In today's environment, traders or lenders act on fight or fight instinct, which means that, well, if they expect others are about to sell Brazilian herald, for US dollars, then they want to get to the exit first. So basically, because the exchange rate market is, you know, it's, it's, a little, it's kind of volatile and also lots of, you know, factors that can affect to this market and a lot of many, many, many traders actually, market participants. So if something happened, then fear, of depreciation become self-fulfilling prophecies. You know? So, you know, if it happened, then everybody starts to exit. Everybody starts to exit. So, which one is better, fixed versus flexible? You know, the, there's, I mean, there's always, always there are pros and cons. So, in favor of flexible, I mean, it's easier to excellent adjustment, you know, market is just, and national policy autonomy, you know, you can actually have the national policies such as fiscal and especially monetary policy. But also there's the bad things, cons for the flexible one, because it increases the uncertainty, right? And no safeguard. If crisis happen, sometimes closing the door may be better. So this is the example. So for the exchange rate is dollar 20 cents per pound today. The next slide, we see that the demand for the pound, see, for access supply at the exchange rate. The United States experience rate deficit under flexible exchange rate regime, the dollar will simply depreciate to 140, right? The price at which supply equals demand and the, the trade definitely disappears. So if you look at this graph, now this is supply and demand. And if demand for pound exceeds the, the supply, then what happens is supply, the demand increases, right? So your demand curve is, was probably here before, right? and then move there. So this is new 
dollar depreciation exchange rate and then what happened is United States experienced trade deficit, right? Now, instead, suppose exchange rate is fixed. We'll see what happened. Now, there's imbalance between supply and demand. Cannot eliminate by price changes, right? So the government have to shift the demand curve to V to D star, right? So if the demand here still, they want to keep it, then they actually need to move the demand curve here. This is not free. They actually have to pay money. So they shift correspondence to contradictory monetary and fiscal policy, basically. Mm -hmm. They have to give up something to keep the exchange rate system fixed, okay? So summarizing this chapter, the international monetary system went through five stages of evolution, the classical gold standard determined exchange rate by gold contents of currencies, the gold standard still of abundance potent. Brand two system was designed to offer the framework for stable exchange rate. So brand two is the fixed one. It's packed to US dollars and US dollar packed to gold. And flexible exchange system actually started from 1973 when United States actually gave up the pact to the gold. The euro has been around since 1999. So that's it for chapter two. So the, the, the takeaway from the chapter two is you have to understand the history of the currency system first and then understand the, the benefit or like advantage disadvantage of the flexible and the fixed exchange rate system by uh, learning from the currency crisis. And we learned the three currency crises. Now we, our, our case study, first case study is a Hong Kong currency cr crisis, Hong Kong financial crisis in Asia, you know, in 1997 actually. You know, um, there are more detailed information there and you can actually get more knowledge from the case study too.